Hi, I'm Miles Aid, a PhD student from Airbus Helicopters and Onera the French Aerospace Lab, and today I will introduce you a part of my work focused on the analysis of fatty crack growth under cyclic motor with a superimposed static biaxial compression. This work was carried out in collaboration with Vincent Bonan, Didier Pacou, and Vincent Carutini from Onera, Véronique Doquet from Laboratoire de Mécanique des Solides, and Pierre Depouon from Airbus Helicopters. So here, the objective of the study is to provide an experimental methodology to perform shear mode fatty crack growth under an additional constant biaxial compression. So experimental test was performed using cruciform specimen of bearing steel with an initial notch oriented to 45 degrees. A biaxial machine was used to load the specimen thanks to two hydraulic cylinders which can be controlled independently. Regarding the instrumentation, we've used the stereo digital image correlation to visualize the displacement fields over the entire specimen. It is used to measure the in-plane and the out-plane opening and sliding displacements in order to find the crack tip location and estimate the stress intensity factors as we will see later. Finally, in order to monitor the crack lengths, we could not use the potential drop method due to the contact of crack lips imposed by the compression. So here, the crack lens was determined by direct optical observation in dark field illumination on the other side of the specimen, thanks to an optical contrast using four low angle sled lightning sources. The proposed procedure is based on force control loading. So a sinusoidal function is applied to the arms of the specimen to load them to tonsil compressive loading to submit the crack to a cyclic shear stress with a static biaxial compression. To obtain the loading condition, a previous elastic finite element computation is performed by applying pressure as boundary condition to identify the relationship between the stress tensor components and the boundary condition to be applied to the biaxial testing machine. And finally, this calibration step allows us to precisely control the crack loading condition and submit it to a cyclic mod 2 plus a static biaxial compression. In order to determine the crack growth rate, we must first estimate the position of the crack tip. To deduce this position from the measured displacement field, Felpayet proposes to position the crack by calculating the displacement gradient of each pixel coming from the digital image correlation. In order to estimate the position of the crack tip, a rich tracking algorithm is applied to follow the evolution of the displacement gradient until a progressive decrease of it, which is considered to be the crack tip. Its results were compared with those from the direct optical observations and a good agreement on the crack tip location was observed. So now let's move on to the presentation of the tests carried out. So here, three tests were performed with different loading conditions to study crack growth in cyclic mode 2. The purpose of the first test was to find which loading condition has to be applied to propagate in pure mode 2. So first of all, a reverse shear loading was applied and four cracks were initiated from the initial notch. Two of them are initiated in pure mode 1 and the other are initiated in mode 2 and after a few micrometers of growth, these cracks bifurcated in mode 1 as classical bifurcation criteria predict. Then, a biaxial compressive stress was superimposed to the reverse shear loading. The normal stress to the crack flanks prevent the crack opening displacement, reducing the mode 1 loading causing the cracks to stop growing. By slightly reducing the normal stress and increasing the amplitude of the cyclic shear stress, the four cracks bifurcate in shear mode and propagate in pure mode 2 over a longer distance than what the classical bifurcation criteria predict. Consequently, the normal stress prevents mode 1 propagation, which promotes the coplanar crack growth when the shear stress is high enough. To confirm this observation, a second test was performed. The aim of this one was to apply the loading conditions which allow the propagation in shear mode in the previous test. So here, we observe two cracks initiated from the initial notch and propagated in pure mode 2 over a longer distance than what the classical bifurcation criteria predict. 
So finally, this test illustrates the influence of the normal stress on the ability to propagate a stable crack in shear mode without bifurcating in mode 1. Finally, the third and last test was performed to reach the low crack growth rate by reducing progressively the shear stress and identify all the Paris area. So now, how can we estimate the stress intensity factors? To get the nominal stress intensity factor, an elastic computation with frictionless contact was performed. With the software named Zcracks developed by Onera, we can insert in a cruciform specimen cracks of complex geometries representative of previous experimental studies. Then, by applying experimental load as boundary conditions, we can estimate the stress intensity factor from a contour integral, and with several stationary computations for various crack lengths resulted from experiments, we can find the Paris law. So, for each test presented before, this kinetic law is obtained. If you look at each test independently, we get different Paris slope, one for each test. This can be explained by the fact that the nominal stress intensity factors do not take into account the physical phenomena like friction, wear, debris or oxidation that can occur between the crack lips when it's loaded in shear mode plus compression. These interactions between the crack lips make the understanding of the crack path complex because they decrease the range of the stress intensity factor in mode 2 because of friction or asperities along crack faces which oppose the displacements of crack planes. To take them into account, we have to estimate the effective stress intensity factors thanks to an inverse method using the digital image correlation. That's why, by a finite element approach based on the principle of the inverse method, we seek to identify an apparent friction coefficient which aims to deal with all the complex intrinsic physical phenomena. After obtaining this friction coefficient, we will be able to estimate with an elastic computation and with a contour integral the value of the effective delta k2. So first, we want to estimate an apparent friction coefficient by inverse method, and for that, we try to replicate with a numerical simulation a sliding displacement amplitude obtained experimentally from digital image correlation. So in a first step, we use the DIC field to extract a sliding displacement profile using two virtual extensometers placed on each side of the crack. The curve below illustrates this profile where the sliding displacement is plotted as a function of the crack tip position. In a second step, an elastoplastic computation with frictional contact is performed using a cruciform specimen with a loading condition equivalent to the test. Here, we try to find an apparent friction coefficient, allowing us to reproduce a similar sliding amplitude profile than the one obtained by the IC. For example, with a friction coefficient equal to zero, the sliding displacement is overestimated compared to the experimental one. To illustrate the influence of plasticity, here we compare the sliding amplitude profile for elastic versus elastic plastic computation. In fact, we observe that the plasticity increases the crack sliding displacement and without taking it into account, we cannot replicate the sliding amplitude displacement obtained experimentally. So now with a friction coefficient mu equal to 0.45, the sliding displacement is underestimated. Consequently, the two effects, the plasticity and the frictional contact between the crack lips must be combined and must be taken into account to reproduce the experimental crack sliding displacement. Finally, with an apparent friction coefficient of 0.27, we are able to find exactly the same sliding displacement profile. Then, this friction coefficient allows taking into account all the physical phenomena that occur between the crack lips at this given time, and now we are able to calculate the effective stress intensity factor. To do so, from an elastic computation with frictional contact, with the apparent friction coefficient determined previously, thanks to the software ZCRAX, we are able to estimate the stress intensity factor thanks to a contour integral. Finally, for a given crack length, this inverse method allows us 
to get a value of apparent friction coefficient, which then allows us to calculate the effective stress intensity factor in mod 2. By applying this procedure on one of the tests presented before, we estimated the evolution of the stress intensity factors and the apparent friction coefficient for different crack lengths. On the graph on the left, we observe the variations of the nominal and effective values of the stress intensity factors. And regarding the graph in the center of the slide, we observe the apparent friction coefficient dependence on the crack lengths. At first sight, this is intriguing because the literature reports in their numerical simulation a constant friction coefficient during the propagation of a crack loaded in shear mode. In order to understand this result, we investigated in the fracture surface and we noticed an evolution of the physical phenomena during the crack growth. In particular, the dark areas observed for a small crack size are traces of oxidation which are not found for a larger crack size. So the presence of this oxidation reduces the frictional contact between the crack lengths and then resulting in a change of the apparent friction coefficient. That's why the evolution of physical phenomena explains why the friction coefficient increases with the crack propagation and therefore the apparent friction coefficient must be considered as a local variable of the problem. So the initial objective was to establish a crack growth law for a crack loaded in cyclic shear mode with a superimposed static biaxial compression by taking into account the complex physical phenomena between the crack lengths. If we estimate the Paris law according to the amplitude of the effective stress intensity factor, we manage to find a single kinetic law for all the tests compared to the previous estimation with the nominal stress intensity factors. So finally, we try to illustrate on this slide a comparison between the propagation kinetics in mode 1 for different loading R ratios with the kinetic law in mode 2 that was just obtained. And we notice that for the same material, we can find similar crack growth rate for the two propagation modes. So to conclude this study, several tests were performed in which crack grow in mode 2 over longer distance than what the classical bifurcation criteria predict. A new crack tip detection method was introduced using the standard deviation of the local displacement gradient. Then the tests carried out allowed us to define a crack growth law in pure mode 2 and to identify physical phenomena taking place between the crack lips during its propagation due to important frictional contact. And finally, an inverse method process was also presented to determine the effective stress intensity factors. Finally, to go deeper in the understanding of the crack pass in MOTU, we observed the initiation of secondary cracks along the main crack flanks which influence the crack pass and the crack growth rate. That's why maybe a further investigation of these branches could shed more light on the core planar growth of the main crack. And finally, the use of propagation law using local approach or taking into account T-stress or plasticity can help to predict the crack path. Thank you.